And we are now going to have a fireside chat. And our fireside chat is called Why Agile Isn't Working For You with James Shaw and Emma Hopkinson Spark. James teaches, writes, and consults on agile software development. He is a recipient of the Agile Alliance Gordon Pask Award for contributions to agile practice, co-author of the Art of Agile Development, and co-creator of the Agile Fluency Model. Emma is the practice director responsible for coaching and transformation in 101 ways, with over 20 years experience in tech and leadership. She was a subject matter expert for the Scrum Alliance in developing the CSP standards, an award-winning coach and co-organizer of the Global Gathering in London 2018. Guys, have a great fireside chat. Over to you. Thanks, Giles. Hi, everyone. Yes, I am Emma. I'm Chief of Staff at 101 Ways. And for roughly this next 20 minutes, I'll be here speaking with James on the topic of, yes, why Agile isn't working for you. James, do you want to do a quick introduction for yourself too? Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Giles. Uh, yeah, I'm James Shore. I've been practicing Agile for over 20 years. And uh, I've seen a lot of different, I work with a lot of companies, seen a lot of different approaches to it, seen a lot of things that don't work, which is what inspired the title of this talk. And I'm really looking forward to uh, spending the next 20 minutes with you, Emma. Great. So yes, just so everyone knows, I think you all know by now the sessions are recorded, so you don't have to worry too much about making notes as you go, but it would be good to see your comments and feedback in the chat. And if you do have a question that you would like to post to James, do please pop it in the ask a question bit at the bottom of your screen and we will try and get through as many of them as we can. So just to kick us off then, the whole why Agile isn't working for you, which is obviously a, a topic most of us can relate to, I'm sure. Um, it's quite a loaded title though, and it does feel a little bit ranty. I would love to know what was going through your head, particularly at the time that you decided to focus on that. It is a little ranty, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I chose that title because, well, frankly, I see Agile not working far, far more often than I see it working. In fact, I see it not working so much that uh, uh, you know, there's a whole saying, cargo cult agile, which is this idea that we'll see, uh, hear some sort of twisted version of them, they try to apply them themselves, and they create a complete mess. Uh, people talk about waterfall as kind of the big bad, right, that we're going to, uh, that we're going to get over. But I would say that agile done poorly is much, much worse than waterfall done well. <laughs> so, um... I think one of the things that you'd said in your in your book was around the particular importance of investing in agile. What do you mean by that, and how can that prevent some of that then? Yeah. So the uh, the second edition of my book, which is the Art of Agile Development, is coming out this year in August or September or maybe October. We'll see what happens. It's being published by O'Reilly, but I'm I'm. Uh, I'm doing an open review of it as I write. So if anybody who's listening wants to see it, it's available at jameshore.com slash s slash aoad2 for Art of Agile Development 2. And um, as, as pieces are finished, they are moved over to the O'Reilly site and you have to pay for them. But a lot of it is actually available for free right now. So the Invest in Agility part, sec, chapter that you're referring to is actually in that second edition, not the first. And I call it Invest in Agility because Agile is ultimately a, a philosophy. It's a way of approaching your work. It's not something that you can do. You can do Scrum and people often, when they say we're doing Agile, they mean we're doing Scrum. Or you can do Safe or you can do Extreme Programming. But uh, Agile itself is just an idea. It's a philosophy. And in order to be successful with that idea, your company, as a CTO, you have to encourage that culture and those ideas in your company. That takes investment, not monetary investment, cultural investment, investing in change. Right. That's a lot harder. I'd rather, I think a lot of people I work with rather just spend the money, wave the magic wand and, uh, and have it just be done. 
So when you're saying about um, Agile not working for you, then how does that how does that go wrong? I, th- I think um, just then when you said that it, you're not talking about monetary investment, you mean cultural investment, that can be a hard concept for people to get their heads around. And how does that correlate to, to Agile going wrong then, do you think? Well, I'd say one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest mistakes I see is uh, companies come to Agile and they they want Agile, they've been told that Agile is a good thing. And so, but they don't really know what it means or what it is. So they they take what they are already doing and they make a couple of minor changes, ones that especially that don't affect managers all that much. And they put the Agile name on it, they, they say we're done and they walk away. But one of the biggest changes that's necessary, one of the biggest investments that's necessary is in agile teams, uh, in an agile development, the team is the resource. Whereas most companies are used to thinking of people as resources, they actually say that, which is kind of dehumanizing. We're going to put three resources on this project, but what you really need is you need a team, a, lo- a, a highly capable team that you've nurtured and grown to be really productive together. You need to, need to assign work to the teams, and not just that you need to give those teams ownership over their process. And that there's a whole lot of ramifications for that, but I've been talking a little while, so I'll, I'll let you <laughs> have a turn. No, it's fine. I think um, just actually while we're, um, while we're just sort of getting into that groundwork of what it means, one of the questions that's already come through is, is about actually defining agile with the air quotes implied as well obviously and and i guess the and i think in your in the title for it it is whether it's title because it's title case or is it just because it is capital a agile and we do see a lot of that kind of lowercase agile uppercase agile so what do you mean when you say um why agile isn't working for you maybe we could just dig into a little bit what we mean by agile for that So uh, for the long, just to to sidestep for a moment, for the longest time, I was really embarrassed uh, spelling Agile with a capital A because there is this whole, we do little A Agile, not big A Agile because big A Agile is corporate Agile. But uh, I'm writing a book and there's style guides and copy editors. And so I have to put the capital A on it. And I've actually come to peace with that because Agile is something very specific. It is what you find at agilemanifesto.org. That is the definition of Agile. That's that's it. And uh, there's, what, 57 words there? I don't know, not very many. Uh, Four statements. Uh, You know, we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools and so forth. That's That's Agile. But if we want to boil it down even further, Martin Fowler, I think, said it best. Uh, Let me make sure I get this right. He said that agile is ad, ad, agile development is adaptive rather than predictive and people oriented versus process oriented. And I think those two things are the things that people who fail to invest in agile well, who fail to see it work well, I think those are the two things that they miss most often. Uh, they try to be predictive, not adaptive, and they try to make the process the focus, not the people. So when people say then that agile isn't working, for them, or as as often the case, as I've seen, and I'm sure you have as well, Agile gets blamed for what's that? Like, oh, it doesn't work here. It's it's Agile has broken something. Scrum has broken something. It doesn't work here. Um, mm-hmm. If you when you boil it down to those principles, though, how could it not work? I mean, and yet still, plenty of people are finding that it doesn't work. You know, why why would it ever not work if people were more important than processes? That how does that add up? Well, it's they're not saying that people is more important the process isn't working they're saying that we tried agile and it didn't give us good results but all too often they they didn't try agile (laughs) they they did something else and put the agile name on it um so i mean i've got a i've got a troubleshooting guide in the in the new edition of the book so things like team members refusing to try stuff uh, lots of interpersonal conflicts lack of collaboration uh, spending a lot of time estimating, planning, and tracking rather than actually delivering results. Uh, failure to deliver, not doing what stakeholders, software not doing what stakeholders needs. I, I could go on. There's I mean, so many ways that Agile doesn't work. And most of them come back to, well, as a company, are we really giving our people and teams and managers the support they need to be successful? 
So how can an organisation, I guess, reflect on that for themselves? So from personal perspective and the way that we work with, with clients sometimes, we get invited in to come and look at a problem. But when we do look at it, it's actually this isn't your problem, your problem's over here. And usually it's something to do with the, the leadership or the culture of the organisation and they were pointing us at symptoms rather than the cause. But not everybody is able to to pull on on that kind of outside perspective all the time. What, how can an organisation kind of reflect on that and learn for that themselves? And you, you can be too close to it to really understand what it is. So so you're left with that symptom of it's not working for us. How do they how do they pull back from the weeds a little bit and try and understand that for themselves, do you think? Right. Well, I mean, that's part of why I'm writing the book. But uh, before it comes out, what can you do in the meantime? If you're listening right now, what can you do? I would say that, uh, go back to that essence of Agile. It's adaptive rather than predictive, people rather than process. That's a little vague. So let's let's talk about I mean, I've got several things we could talk about, but let's talk about something really specific. Delegate authority and responsibility to your teams. So Agile is people-oriented rather than process-oriented. So if you're using something like Jira or another of those glorified databases to control how your teams do their work, you're missing the point. Those tools are actually very anti-Agile. If you're using them to track your teams rather than creating a situation where the teams can be successful and you don't have to track them, you're missing the point. So how can you put more responsibility and ownership into the teams and help them be successful? And that may mean providing training or something else, or it may just mean you know giving them the space to learn. People can learn on their own, it just takes more time. And that requires that you not have them constantly under the gun from a schedule perspective. People don't learn well when they feel like they're constantly being pushed to deliver. Uh, Steve McConnell had a book, a Rapid Development, in the 90s, uh, where he quoted some uh, he quoted some research that says that developer developers are really good at doing what you ask, but they can only do one thing. So if you say development speed is most important, they will prioritize that. If you say defects are most important, lack of, they will prioritize that. If you say learning is most important, they will prioritize that, but they can only prioritize one thing. So if you want your teams to get better, make the space for them to get better. What about, I guess, pushing it beyond the the um, just the development? You often see that it, like I think you said before, that you they'll they'll try something and maybe it doesn't impact management or it doesn't grow, but sooner or later it hits that hits that bubble, doesn't it? It hits the glass ceiling of of now. Actually, where does it go? Thinking in terms of like if HR isn't aligned, if marketing isn't aligned, if finance isn't aligned, how many times do you see? Um, see engineering and product teams wanting to to go and uh, deli deliver something iteratively, but they've got to have a, a budget agreed two years in advance for something. How do you how do you spread those tentacles further out into the organisation to to truly make it successful? Then, well, when I when I work with a company, and I think the audience here has the capability to make this happen. If, if this is the CTO Craft Conference, and the audience here is senior management. You do have the ability to make this work. Um, Agile is successful when it comes from the bottom up and from the top down. Uh, you need both. And uh, luckily, you know, you can make that happen. You and the audience, you can make that happen. It is definitely true that a couple of the things that I see companies struggle with is they take a process over people approach. So they have an HR environment which emphasizes individual performance and rewards rather than team performance. And that can be really deadly to an agile team oriented process. And they have a predictive governance style. So they're using projects where they say, we're funding, we're funding the work on a one year time scale. predict what you're gonna get done in the next year, and then we'll track according to your prediction and you're successful if you meet it. Well, agile's adaptive. And so we want to be able to change our plans so we can deliver better things. We wanna go out and find better things to do and deliver on those but that doesn't work as well in a predictive environment. So uh, look for ways to move to an agile governance rather than a project-oriented governance where you're looking at products and assigning budget on a business as usual basis. This team costs us 100,000 a month or you know whatever, whatever it is. And we're gonna expect that they spend that and we're gonna expect that they give us more than $100,000 a month in value back out. Uh, and look at it from that perspective. What's the value that you're getting for the cost, not are you just on track? 
Interesting. One of the questions that's come through, and I wonder um, uh, whether whether I guess uh, your your answer to that can be kind of reframing this question slightly. So it's from Simone. It says, um, "What do you do if you still need to predict or forecast?" Now, is what you're saying that you that you should? Are there ever circumstances where you do need to predict or forecast, or the the prediction seems to be more aligned to how much value can we predict we get out of this team, rather than what are the things we think we can we can predict they'll be doing? Is that what you're saying, or how would you frame that? No, a little bit of both. Um, I think so. Agile development done right is very very pragmatic and. It is not pragmatic to say, oh, forecasts and predictions are unimportant. You absolutely have situations where you need to predict and forecast. And a lot of organizations want those predictions and forecasts not because the market needs them, not because there's a business need, but because their governance style requires it. So you can change that. <laughs> and please do, because that's really important. Now, you you can be successful with agile, active approach. Uh, there are other things about Agile that are really nice to have, and it is compatible with a predictive approach. You're just missing out. But there are also times, you know, some marketing campaigns have immensely long lead times, and people need to know, you know, three months in advance, what are we going to put in this marketing video that we say that our new release of the software is going to do? Uh, you need to make some predictions in that case, and you absolutely can. There are ways of predicting very well in Agile that are empirical and data-oriented and give you great results. I'm not going to go into all those little nitty gritty details right now, but you can do that. Uh, you can also, and this is very powerful, just say, here is our date. We know that we're going to a trade show on October 11th. We will have, we will be shipped on October 1st and ready for that trade show. We're not exactly sure what's going to go in there. We just know it's the most viable thing possible. It's very easy and agile to set a firm, solid release date and always hit that date. Uh, you just, it's a little harder to say exactly what's going to be in it. And then there are forecasting techniques that allow you to say, well, we're going to have between this and this, and we'll guarantee this, and we're hoping for this, and it will be somewhere in the middle. Right. OK. Um, another question that's coming as well, and I guess um, back into that kind of, it sounded a bit ranty at the, the beginning in the title, which probably um, leads on to nicely. Everyone loves a war story, and and what details can you tell us? Any juicy stuff. Of um, From Siobhan, I think it says, um, what are the biggest mistakes that you encountered in trying Agile? And maybe what are the most important aspects to focus on when you're trying to do it right as well? So yeah, give us some juicy mm. stuff. What have you seen go really bad? Well, I'm not going to say <laughs> uh, a large mistake that I've seen is a measurement oriented approach to an agile change. So uh, some of you in the audience may be familiar with theory X and theory Y management. Uh, theory X management is uh, is based on extrinsic motivators. It's saying that, well, fundamentally, our workers are not going to do a good job unless we coerce them. So we're going to measure them, we're going to reward them, and they're going to use those motivators to force them to go in the right direction. That's theory X management. If you go back to the 50s, it actually has this sort of undercurrent of workers are inherently lazy and they want us to do this because otherwise they won't be motivated. I think people today don't say that, but it's kind of there in the background. Theory why management is the agile approach. It says that uh, we're working with people who are inherently intrinsically motivated. They have this desire to do good work um, because they are enjoy the challenge or they want to do something insanely great for customers or they just like being part of a really good team. And so in that environment, the job of management isn't to come up with the right reward structures, but instead it's to come up with the right um, inspiration to find what motivates each of your employees, and this is sort of team level management, to find what motivates the members of the teams and to connect the work that needs to be done with those motivations so that people will have, take advantage of that natural capability to do their best work. This is very much the Agile style because in Agile we're people oriented, so we need to come to the people that we have if, you, if you're hiring people who aren't motivated by doing good work, you're hiring the wrong people. Now, coming back up to the CTO level, what can the CTO do? Well, the CTO needs to really impress on the team level managers that this is about creating an environment where teams can succeed, uh, connecting teams' motivation to the work to be done, and not just trying to, uh, 
coerce through reward systems. So I haven't really answered the question yet. That was sort of the intro. Uh, anything you want to say before I get into the story itself? No, no, I definitely want the story. <laughs> All right. I am a little ranty. I'm drinking my coffee, though, so it's getting better. So uh, the this a lot of managers, especially in software development, want to have this really mechanistic view of the world where if I put in input A, which is a reward program of X, I will get out output B, which is the behavior I want. Doesn't work. Uh, there is too many things in software development that cannot be measured, and the things you don't measure are the things that are going to go by the wayside. So I was working at a well-known company. Um, I won't say what industry they're in because then you'd instantly recognize them. They're very well-known uh, in Silicon Valley, and uh, they were trying to do bring a whole division over to Agile, uh, 150, 200 people. And uh, the, the, the VP of engineering, basically the CTO for that division, had read Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren and Jess Humble, which is a fantastic book. And one of the things, and it talks about, you know, companies that are successful, high performance, have these characteristics. He read that and he got out of it, we need test coverage, which is good. You need good quality tests to be really effective as an agile, as an agile organization. And so he said, we need, I don't remember the exact number, we must have 85% code coverage. Everything you write must have tests. If you don't do it, find another job. This is this is your performance review, whether you're writing tests. So this is gonna be great, right? We're gonna get that 90% code coverage. We're gonna get the uh, high quality. Agile. We're gonna have to get, the, <laughs> we're, we're gonna be agile. We're gonna lower our mean time between failures. We're gonna get accelerate. It's gonna be awesome, right? What do you think happened? I imagine they have a lot of people around. <laughs> uh, they everybody stuck around, which is unfortunate, because <laughs> because what they did, what they did, and I see this over and over again. Code coverage is one of those metrics that people just love. Oh, they they just wrote game a it. lot of tests. Yeah, of course they game it um, because you've only got so much time, and if you're given the choice between doing what intrinsically motivates you to do right or you know, what's going to affect your next paycheck, you will do whatever gets you that highest score, but you're not going to do what's right. So they wrote a lot of really, really bad tests. I saw all these end-to-end -end tests that uh, didn't have any assertions in them, didn't actually check anything, but took minutes to run because they were running through the entire application, getting as much code coverage as you could possibly get out of one test, testing nothing, failing randomly, making everything worse, slowing the, slowing the teams down, wasting time. Don't do it. Put people first. Give them the ability and power to do what's right. Get rid of JIRA. Um, let them make their own decisions <laughs> about uh, what they're going to deliver. And, uh, and read my book because there's even more in there. <laughs> we are uh, really close to time. Is there any other thoughts you want to just leave people with before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think that covers it. It is pretty ranty. There is, uh, of course, a lot of very concrete, practical things we could talk about. But I think in a 20 minute fireside chat, it's a little more fun to, to go to go there high were, level. There were a few questions from the audience we didn't get to, and they would have been awesome opportunities for more rants along the lines of what do we think of certifications? How do you get rid of JIRA? It's clearly a whole other section we should do on, on rants <laughs> instead. Cool. Yes, we'll absolutely. Wrap up there, well, then. We just have to have another talk. We will. Thanks, James. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.